Well, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce one of our own as our uh, colloquium speaker for this afternoon. Uh, Jim Schwigerling is a uh, professor in, in optical sciences. Uh, he uh, got his bachelor's degree from the University of Rochester in 1990, his master's from the University of Rochester in 1991, uh, and then decided to come over to the warmth, yep. and uh, got his PhD from the College of Optical Sciences, or I guess back then it was the center, uh, in 1995 under uh, John Grievenkamp. Uh, he's worked a little bit at Eastman Kodak uh, and uh, received Eastman Kodak scholarships and fellowships. Uh, he's also received a, a career development award uh, for the research for research to uh, prevent blindness. Uh, he's published numerous papers and book chapters, and uh, also uh, wrote the book uh, "The Field Guide to Visual and Ophthalmic Optics." Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Jim. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Matt. All right. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. So uh, today uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, trying to relate uh, wavefront error and amplization to the optical transfer function. And um, so, um, as we all know, uh, the incoherent uh, optical transfer function sort of describes the uh, reduction in contrast and potential phase shift of a sinusoidal input to an optical system. And it it's, uh, uh, handles all the different orientations, all the different spatial frequencies. And my goal here really is to uh, try to understand the connection between if we have a certain wavefront error and the pupil, how does that affect the MTF? It sort of gets lost in, in the way that uh, um, it uh, is calculated now. And so um, the idea here is to, to try to, to understand those uh, relationships a little bit. So uh, today I'm only going to consider uh, sort of rotationally symmetric systems because the math gets horribly nasty very, very quickly. Um, so we'll just stick with that uh, uh, simple case. And I'll show you some of the results that we're getting uh, and compare them to uh, sort of known uh, numerical uh, results, uh, results. And then this has uh, application to uh, things like uh, MTF uh, optimization in uh, lens design and for things like wavefront coding uh, or for uh, things that I'm interested in, sort of multifocal or extended depth of focus uh, optical systems. Um, so just a little bit of background. Uh, so in the 1970s, uh, Kinter uh, suggested trying to fit the um, uh, optical transfer function to a set of Zernike polynomials. So Zernikes are good for representing things on round uh, uh, areas. Um, and uh, more recently, this has been formalized. So you can go through and you can calculate all the Zernike coefficients and you can, you can fit this data. The problem is that the Zernikes are not the best thing for representing uh, the optical transfer function. And the reason is because in the middle here, you tend to have this slope dot discontinuity. You have this point at the center of your optical transfer function. And you need an awful lot of Zernike terms to get something that looks like a point because they're all nice, smoothly varying surfaces uh, that are, have continuous slope uh, at the origin. Uh, so what I want to find is a natural set of functions uh, that we can use to represent the optical transfer function uh, as a series. And then the expansion coefficient of those, those series are going to be related to our wavefront error and our appetization of the, of the system. So uh, just some um, reasons uh, while I'm, why I'm going down this road, just some, some uh, examples of applications and stuff like that. So uh, here's an uh, uh, artificial lens that's implanted into the eye after uh, cataract surgery, and it has a diffractive uh, structure on it. And the goal of the diffractive structure here is to give you two simultaneous object planes for one image plane on your retina. And so the idea here is that one of those planes would be for far away and one would be for, for up close. And these are sort of superimposed on top of each other. And if you uh, look at the um, uh, modulation transfer function of, uh, of this particular lens and you do it through focus, you get a good peak for one distance, and you get a secondary peak for another, another distance. And so what we'd like to do is come up with ways to connect what's on here to try to tailor what's going on here in order to create better performance uh, for this, this multi-focal uh, 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 system. Uh, here's another application. 
Um, this one isn't, you know, intuitively obvious from the, the tools that, that we have. So uh, in microscopy, you can take a uh, plate and put it in your system and add uh, various either phase and or transmission uh, rings onto that plate and you can apodize uh, the image and effectively what that does is it reduces uh, halos in your system and so you go from something that tends to have these ring structures around it and it uh, enhances the contrast and reduces uh, the system and then here you can start to see more and more details um, into uh, into the, the cell here and so again here, here you have these different transmissions and phases that are introduced in your optical system and you want to get to some sort of MTF optimization to optimize the uh, contrast in your, your final image. Um, here's another example. Again, I don't think this one is intuitively uh, obvious. This is a uh, phase um, plate that's put into the uh, pupil of a camera and it has sort of uniformly spaced grooves, like a LP record, if you are old enough to remember what one of those are. Uh, but the heights of these grooves are sort of randomly uh, spaced, or randomly um, elevated. And turns out with such a system, what you can do is you can take a picture of a scene, and it gives you sort of poor image quality for all distances. But you can post-process this image and you can, can recover a lot of the detail so that you can get uh, good in-focus uh, images, recover higher spatial frequencies at all these distances simultaneously. This is in comparison to a conventional camera where if you focus in the distance, you completely blur out uh, the, the intermediate and, and near regions. And as you shift your focus, you lose information in those other spaces. Again, I don't think this is obvious, but how do we, how do we come up with these patterns and how do we tailor them and optimize them to uh, enhance the, these effects? So these are just some applications that I'm, I'm kind of interested in. Um, so uh, there's a couple ways to, um, to calculate the um, uh, optical transfer function. So uh, probably the, the first way uh, is the autocorrelation of the pu pupil function. Pupil function is a complex function. Uh, it contains the, the aperture and any sort of amplitude and phase variation within the uh, exit pupil of the system. And we take two of these on top of each other, and we shift them relative to each other, and when they overlap, we look at the correlation between the wave fronts in there, and that gives us an idea about the um, optical transfer function. And then uh, other things that I'll be hitting on today, um, modulus of that uh, is just the MTF, and the argument of the OTF is the phase transfer function. Uh, turns out that that integration, that shifting and integration, uh, pretty slow from a computational standpoint. Uh, so usually the, the faster route uh, to go is to use uh, um, Fourier transforms. And so in this case, uh, we can find the intensity uh, point spread function by uh, Fourier transforming the pupil function, take the modulus squared of that to get the irradiance pattern, and then we take the inverse transform of uh, that point spread function in order to get to our OTF. So this is definitely faster than that computationally. But if you're doing something like trying to optimize um, uh, MTF and lens design code, this is still pretty slow because you make a little tweak to one of the surfaces in your, in your design, you FFT, FFT, get the OTF, compare it to the value, go back, make another change to your, your system, and go through that process many, many, many times. So there's lots and lots of FFTs there. And so this can get bogged down pretty, pretty quickly. So one of the other goals here is to look at some ways to, to try to, to um, navigate through here faster. Um, so there's a limited number of, uh, of analytic solutions to calculating the um, optical transfer function. I think it's limited to about one 
for that has a, a, a finite uh, result, and that's for the diffraction limited case. So if we have no aberrations and we have a circular pupil, uh, we can actually come up with, uh, we can solve that integral and uh, come up with something that has this square root and this arc cosine term in it. If we plot that, it's roughly linear, and then it sort of slopes off uh, towards the end here. Um, and then beyond that, uh, it's, uh, it's zero everywhere. So, um, so going forward here, there is some nasty mathematics that uh, pop up in here. And the question, you know, whenever you're giving talks like this stuff and you have all this mathematics, and is, is how do you make the math something a little more palatable so that as I look out at the audience here, your eyes aren't just glazing over and uh, you're, you're lost uh, to, to somewhere else. And so the, the way that uh, I'm going to do that today is through uh, comedy. Okay? So um, we're going to use divine comedy in order to, uh, uh, to go on this uh, mathematical uh, journey here. So. Uh, Dante was an Italian, and he wrote the Divine Comedy back in the 1300s, and it's broken up into uh, three separate parts. And so the first part is called the Inferno, and the Inferno is Italian for hell, okay? And so th there's these layers and layers of hell. The story goes that uh, Dante had lost his way, and uh, he met up with a, a poet named Virgil, and they sort of descended into the depths of hell, and they saw all the terrible, terrible things uh, that were done to people who had committed various atrocities in, in the real world as they uh, descended uh, down in here. And so today I'm going to take you on a mathematical journey into the inferno, talk about some of the nasty things that I encountered along uh, the way here. And... Uh, if we uh, zoom in here on one of these levels here, there happens to be this uh, area where these guys are doing this integral that has not one, not two, but three Bessel functions in it. And uh, that, one, that one's uh, particularly uh, bad. So, all right, so let's start our, uh, our mathematical journey here, and, uh, and we'll see where it, uh, where it takes us. So uh, we start off with a rotationally symmetric optical system, and I'm going to write the pupil function uh, in terms of just the cylinder function, so, so the round pupil, and then even powers of rho, which is my um, radial coordinate. And so this is going to be things like uh, rho squared, rho fourth, that kind of stuff. And in general, I'll make these coefficients uh, complex. And so if I make them complex, I can capture things about the apodization or the, the transmission of the exit pupil in there. And then I can also um, uh, capture the, the wavefront uh, error coefficients into this uh, uh, single coefficient here. And uh, my goal now is to take that complex exponential and I want to write it as a sum of uh, Zernike functions. And so I'm going to expand my complex exponential as a series, and I'm going to write in terms of these Zernike polynomials instead of uh, complex exponentials. And if I go through all that, I can actually come up with what uh, these coefficients are for each one of these. This looks, again, nasty, but it actually simplifies down to, to something uh, you know, relatively straightforward. But keep these in mind. These are the things that we're going to use in order to relate uh, the uh, wavefront error and the optimization coefficients uh, between the optical transfer function and the, uh, the, the pupil function. So just some simple examples to, to show that uh, these aren't um, things that are so terrible. So if we have a case where we just have something like defocus uh, and or Gaussian apodization in there, you just get uh, a, a, a pupil function that looks like an infinite series here, and you have these coefficients that encode the defocus and, and apodization. If we add in some spherical aberration, you get uh, uh, spherical aberration terms 
and sort of mixed terms that are uh, the relationship between uh, the defocus and the, and the spherical aberration. And the B coefficients are basically just collecting, um, here's all the row squared terms, so that would be, you know, a B term. Here's all the row four terms, so that would have the B term, and so on. So you're collecting all the powers of rows, and these Bs uh, that will show up over and over are just the coefficients that go in front of those, those powers. Um, so our next step on our journey here is to look at the amplitude point spread function. So we're going to Fourier transform the pupil function and get what the electric field amplitude is uh, in the image plane. Since everything's rotationally symmetric, this Fourier transform basically just turns into a Henkel transform where we multiply by um, the zeroth order Bessel function and integrate in order to um, in order to take that transform. And if you go back to um, Cernicke's original paper, he derived this nice integral uh, that uh, connects the Zernike polynomials to uh, the Bessel functions here. And you can actually do these integrals now uh, based on that. And it comes up with a very nice uh, result where the amplitude is just these B coefficients and then some Bessel function over R. And it turns out that these are orthogonal uh, sets, so we can actually uh, create a uh, orthogonal expansion of the amplitude point spread function based on on uh, these types of uh, uh, functions here. All right, down another level um, on our journey here. So next thing we want to do is we want to find the intensity uh, point spread function. So we're going to take the amplitude point spread function, multiply it by its comp complex conjugate and combine everything together and what you get are now products of uh, these two uh, Bessel functions over, over R and then you have these uh, the two uh, B coefficients and some of these are going to be for uh, the same types of terms and so these are just going to become a modulus squared and then there's going to be a bunch of terms that are sort of like the mixed uh, terms uh, between, uh, between the two of them. And um, one other thing that's useful, if we integrate this, um, it will give us the area or volume under the, the point spread function. And it just turns out that it's roughly related to just the sum of the squares of the coefficients that are the same as each other. So all the mixed uh, coefficients uh, uh, go away in that case. And it's just these, uh, these coefficients that, uh, that stick around. All right, so now here's where things start getting nasty. Okay. Um, so now we want to take the Fourier transform of our intensity point spread function and come up with um, the optical transfer function of, uh, of the system. And so again, we're going to take the Henkel transform. Everything's rotationally symmetric. And we come up with this integral with the three Bessel functions in it. And, uh, that one I don't know off the, the top of my head, and it's, it's not intuitively obvious how to uh, attack that one. But if we uh, just define it, I'll call it this capital G here, uh, we have this nice representation of the optical transfer function. It's basically just uh, some coefficient which is related to uh, these, these two B coefficients uh, times some function here. Okay, So this is just a series expansion. These are the expansion coefficients. These are the functions that we're expanding stuff in. So what we'd like to do is figure out what these, these functions are. So how do we go about doing that? Well, you can try this book, and uh, you may get lucky, but no such luck. Uh, there's this book, uh, and again, not much luck there. So I went to the biggest repository of mathematical knowledge that I could find and went to Google here. And so if you Google integrals with three Bessel functions in it, uh, you come up with actually some hits. So here's the first one, uh, computation of infinite in integrals involving three Bessel functions. Uh, so that sounds pretty promising. And, uh, but uh, this actually uh, caught my eye when I, uh, <laughs> when I, uh, 
was looking at this. So uh, I was a little curious about that. So I did a little a little research on uh, Mr. Fabricant here, and uh, it turns out he uh, assassinated four of his colleagues for not getting tenure in his uh, department. And so, um, so I guess there actually is a special place in hell for people who do integrals with three uh, uh, three Bessel functions in them. So. Um, a little more Googling, and uh, I came across this paper. And uh, so this one, uh, integrals involving the product of three Bessel functions, uh, sounds encouraging. Um, and actually, it turned out pretty good. So he um, used, uh, if you remember back to your complex analysis class, there's something called the residue theorem, where if you have like a function, you can simplify it down to an integral around places where the function tends to blow up. Um, and so he uses this and derives a analytical solution for um, the uh, three Bessel function integral. Problem is, this was for simple poles. So if you remember, there's many ways to blow up. And, and unfortunately, in the problem that I have, we have multiple ways to blow up at the same point instead of a simple one. But I know how to solve that problem. I know how to do that. So I use Tyler's technique here in order to do those integrals. Um, that's, uh, that we're interested in. And if you uh, go through and, uh, and uh, calculate these, this is what you get. Okay. So uh, if you have the same uh, indices on here, you get something, this function here is called a generalized hypergeometric function. And if they're not the same, you get another one and it's even nastier than the first one. And so what have I done here? I, I've managed to go through all this nasty math, and I've got to something that's actually nasty. And these are nasty because there's no good computational solutions to generalize these. These are very super general functions, which means there's not a good way to f rapidly uh, calculate them. So at this point, I am uh, sort of down here in the... Uh, the depths of hell. I'm uh, just below hedge fund managers here and dealing with uh, the generalized uh, hypergeometric functions here. So when Dante got to uh, this point, uh, he and uh, Virgil figured out how to get out of hell here. Um, they uh, actually were at the center of the Earth, and they found if they went on the other side, gravity actually pushed you out the other side of the, uh, the Earth, and they were able to, to get to uh, a new place called Purgatory. Okay? And so in Purgatory, uh, there's these seven levels of Purgatory that uh, they had to ascend up, and at the top is, is Heaven. Okay? So that's sort of the ultimate goal up here. And so I'm hoping now to get to at least to purgatory with my generalized uh, hypergeometric uh, functions here. So, well, let's look at the first one here and uh, try to figure out, you know, what this is. And so if we look at it, it doesn't really mean much. If you look at the definition of these things, it's just a big, long, nasty sum with a bunch of gamma functions and pock hammer symbols and all sorts of crazy math things I had never heard about before I started this whole thing. But if we plot it, hey, that looks, that looks pretty familiar, actually. So this is actually just the um, diffraction-limited OTF. Okay, and this is sort of makes sense. Uh, this is the first term in here, and so it looks like our perfect case and stuff like that. And so we can write this as a function, okay? So we know the answer to this one already. But what's really cool is that you can do this for the other ones, too. So they actually collapse down into nice, elementary, uh, finite types of things. And they all have sort of a similar type of form. They have this beta square root term with some polynomial here. And they have this arc cosine term with some polynomials out in front of them. Uh, but now. We can code these extremely fast. Okay, these are these are finite solutions. There's no infinite sums or or anything in here. 
And so this gives us a very quick way to, to calculate these various terms um, in, the, in the series expansion. So let's take a look at uh, uh, some of these terms. Uh, so the top row here are uh, terms where uh, the two indices um, are the same. And in these cases, um, you always have something where it uh, has a finite value at the origin, and then it decays. And then with this one, you have this sort of oscillation, a couple more oscillations as you, as you go across here. So you can sort of think of this maybe as like a, a you know, 4A series or something like that, where you're having increased spatial frequency, uh, but it's something where it comes to a point uh, at the origin, and you can spin this thing around the axis. And then in the cases where the two indices are different, you get something that's sort of sinusoidal, but they're zero on both ends. And so our optical transfer function now can be um, represented as a sum of these uh, functions. And the coefficients or weightings on each one of these is going to tell us something about the um, uh, wavefront error and the appetization of the system. So let's, uh, let's test this out a little bit and, uh, and see uh, what, uh, uh, what we can do with it. So um, first uh, obvious uh, test was to try something where we just have simple defocus in the system. And so I wanted to find uh, a good set of uh, data for uh, defocus MTFs. And I came across uh, this table or this paper here, which has nice published uh, numbers uh, uh, numerically calculated for various levels of defocus. Now, the downside here is that this is a scanned paper, and there are lots and lots of numbers in there. And so uh, I'm not really into sort of typing all these things in. So I figured, OK, well, I can use optical character uh, recognition to, to just get these things in here. Uh, but I don't have optical character recognition software, and I'm pretty cheap. So do you have a question? Oh, OK. All right. Well, thank you. Well, I found freeocr.com. So, uh, so you can upload an image to this, and they will spit out a reasonably reliable uh, list of numbers that uh, don't seem randomly generated. Yes? Uh, they'll do it, for, do it for you. Okay, well, it's good to know now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, use a little OCR, a little uh, OCD, and uh, put the two of them together. And before I uh, knew it, I had some nice uh, plots, uh, good to six decimal places of uh, defocused um, uh, MTF. And if I compare the prediction of the, uh, of the OTF series expansion with these, I can match these to six decimal places with relatively few terms in my expansion. And so that's, that's pretty cool. So, so I don't need to do much in order to represent these things that, uh, um, that actually have a fair, you know, a fair amount of uh, aberration in it. So it's a compact uh, representation of the system. Um, if we look at uh, the expansion coefficients here, did you have another? Yes. Right now you are only dealing with the axis. Correct. Yeah. Right. right. Yep. And uh, um, I'll talk a little bit about generalizing it, but, but uh, um, this is enough for today, I think. <laughs> um, so if we look at the coefficients of our expansion here, um, it's, it's kind of cool. So uh, we start off where we have uh, in blue the uh, ideal diffraction limited case. And so in that case, our expansion coefficient is just equal to 1, and all the rest of them are 0, as we'd expect. And as we start introducing uh, different levels of defocus, what happens is energy is pulled out of this first one, and it's distributed into uh, the next couple here. And the way that they're normalized here, uh, the sum of the coefficients should add up to 1. 
Okay, so this is a very nice uh, way to see how quickly our um, series converges uh, because if we start adding up these coefficients and we got nine, you know, 0.99, we know that we're within about 1% of, of the optical transfer function. And so we, we know when to stop in our series expansion uh, by looking at these terms. And as we add more terms, uh, this energy sort of gets progressively redistributed uh, across to, uh, to the higher, higher terms and such. Um, this also gives us a uh, interesting way to think about uh, doing um, optimization with the OTF. And so let's say you want to have a diffraction limited system. So one of the things you can do is try to um, either get that first coefficient up to uh, as close to one as possible because it's sucking energy from all the other coefficients or equivalently if you do one minus that value, if you minimize that value, usually we like to minimize things instead of maximize things, um, it's, it's the same type of thing. And so if we minimize that quantity here, it will tend to pull the energy from the other coefficients and try to put it all into, uh, into that center one. And roughly based on uh, this previous plot here, um, go back. So when we added a quarter wave of defocus, this first term dropped to um, uh, 0.08. So if we minimize uh, our system and we get it below uh, 0.2 for that, uh, for that uh, expansion, we should be pretty close to diffraction limited. Okay? And so it's, it's a metric of the performance of your system, and it's something akin to uh, Rayleigh's criterion, uh, or sort of encircled energy. So the, uh, the amount of that first coefficient is going to encode how much energy is contained within uh, the diffraction uh, limited point spread function. We can think of all this math that we did here as you have a, in point spread space, you have an airy pattern, and then you have some other patterns that are being added to it. And that first coefficient says, I have you know, this much in my airy pattern, and then the rest of the energy going into these other patterns that are superimposed on top of it. Um, so what can we do uh, with this? Well, one thing is here I did the case where I uh, have now defocus and uh, primary uh, spherical aberration, and I plotted the region where I'm uh, below this 0.2 threshold. So this is where I would expect the system to be essentially uh, diffraction limited. And obviously the best case scenario is if I have no defocus and no spherical aberration, I can be diffraction limited. But anywhere in this valley here, I'm within roughly a quarter wave of, um, of uh, performance here. And what's interesting about this is that this is exactly where we talk about uh, when we have spherical aberration and we want to stick a plane somewhere in here to give you sort of best focus when you have spherical aberration present. These planes actually represent different lines on here. So the top one is uh, mid focus where there, um, you have equal balance between the spherical and the defocus, so it's sort of halfway in between here, it sort of minimizes the uh, uh, variance if I uh, remember correctly. Uh, but really, anywhere in this valley, um, you're, you're pretty close to, to fraction limited with, with that case. Um, here's some other uh, examples, things that you can do uh, with this type of system. So this is a, a Gaussian apodization. So um, this is a photographic technique called uh, bokeh where um, if you are taking a picture of something and in the background you have some out of focus bright spots, you'll get something that looks like the defocus diffraction pattern of the uh, exit pupil. 
And some people like this, uh, some people don't like this. This is kind of like an, almost an art form in uh, some uh, photography circles. And so uh, if you look close enough here, you can actually see the hexagonal uh, pattern of the, the aperture stop in here. If you instead put a, uh, in your exit pupil, you put a mask that now rolls off in intensity uh, towards the periphery here, you can, um, sort of blend out or smooth out uh, those, those sharp edges and instead have these uh, continuous uh, transitions here. So we can model this exactly like we did uh, with defocus. And if we uh, compare the uh, MTF uh, that are numerically calculated uh, for various levels of appetization uh, to the OTF model, Again, we only need relatively few terms in order to represent these uh, uh, different uh, uh, MTF or OTF uh, curves. Okay, uh, another application here uh, is uh, extended uh, depth of focus. So this is something that I'm interested in uh, for uh, the eye. Um, and with the eye, you don't really have the luxury of... Uh, post-processing uh, that you would uh, with uh, the example that we showed, showed before. So a lot of wavefront coding uh, puts some sort of phase mask in the, in the exit pupil, takes a lousy picture, and then in the computer um, regenerates uh, stuff based on the information known about, about the system. If we're doing this in the eye, uh, we don't have that post-processing step. And so, um, one of the things we'd like to do is come up with a way to really extend depth of focus. And there's different reasons for doing this. So uh, one reason would be as, as you get older, you lose the ability to focus up close. So if you had a really big depth of focus, uh, you could just have things in focus up close and off of the distance, and you wouldn't need uh, any sort of correction. Another example would be is if you have astigmatism in your eye, but you had lots of depth of focus, it wouldn't matter if you had that astigmatism because things would still be uh, reasonably in focus in the, in the various um, um, orientations. So uh, here um, I took uh, um, spherical aberration up to eighth order. So we have defocus and primary, secondary, tertiary spherical aberration. And I try to do uh, optimization of uh, these terms where uh, I'm, the goal, the end point here is to maximize the area under the OTF uh, at a certain spatial frequency, 100 cycles per millimeter, um, for targets that are 33 centimeters off to infinity. So I'm looking at sort of through focus OTF here and trying to maximize how much area is under that through focus curve. On the top is for a, uh, just a conventional uh, system with, a, in this case, a four millimeter pupil. And it's focused off at infinity. So at infinity, you look at a target, you get a nice sharp high contrast target. But as soon as you add a little bit of defocus in there, it very rapidly falls off and you, you lose everything. So I went through this optimization procedure to see if I could uh, to extend this range by playing with the weights on all the different uh, spherical aberration coefficients. And by golly, yes, you can certainly get this uh, extended depth of focus, okay? So this is going from something like 50 centimeters from here to infinity, and everything's in focus, but you can see the trade-off here. The trade-off is I really have degraded my contrast. There's some sort of conservation of contrast that goes on and all these things is if I take that contrast, I have to redistribute it over, over the space here. But uh, it certainly worked. Um, the other interesting thing is that this process took me somewhere where I never expected to go. Okay, so it came up with a solution that's not intuitive to, to what I thought would happen. And so if we look at the wavefront error that um, came up because of this uh, depth of, uh, extended depth of focus, this is the result of the optimization here. Okay, so very flat in the center here, and then it's very curved at the edge here. And if you look at the units here, this is 
900 microns of spherical aberration at the edge of your pupil. Okay, I mean, you can measure this with a, a ruler, right? This is, this is enormous, okay? So that's weird, okay? I don't understand what's going on here. But if I zoom in, change my scales a little bit, what's happening is that over the center, two millimeters of my pupil here, I get something that looks like this. And as I add um, defocus to this, this whole thing sort of bends upwards. And it keeps my wavefront error pretty small. But as soon as I get out here, it goes screaming off into uh, infinity, essentially. And so what this is doing is it's sort of like adding a pinhole to your eye. But the pinhole now is not uh, a transmission. It's phase. Okay, So it's letting the stuff go through the center two millimeters of my pupil. And then instead of blocking the stuff outside of that, it's actually putting it so far out of focus that it can't really do anything to, to my image. Okay, so it's like a, a phase only um, small pupil. Okay, so it's extending depth of focus with the small pupil, but purely in phase. And that's, uh, that, I don't know, just never expected anything like that to, uh, to, really, uh, to really appear. Uh, what are some other things uh, here? Uh, let's see. So I have uh, I've looked at annular pupils uh, a little bit here, and uh, in that case, um, you can describe the amplitude point spread function. Uh, shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, it's basically the uh, what you get with the full pupil, and you subtract off uh, what you get with the blocked pupil. Okay, and if you uh, turn that into the intensity point spread function, you get something that looks like uh, airy pattern uh, minus the airy pattern. Um, I might have a sign wrong here, but minus the airy pattern uh, from, the, uh, from the block portion. And then there's this mix term uh, that happens between the two. And so in our previous notation, this is just our uh, diffraction limited OTF for the full pupil. Uh, we remove off some scaled version of the uh, uh, smaller pupil that's being blocked. And then there's this mixed term uh, that happens in here. And now I've gotten back to my integral with three Bessel functions in it. And it turns out that I can't use the same tricks uh, for this one. So this one's still a, uh, a work in project progress here. This little epsilon here kind of screws everything up. So, but we can look at um, what, uh, what the, that integral should look like, what we'd expect it to look like. Um, here are some uh, numerical data for uh, annular pupils uh, for different, uh, uh, different sizes of the annually. Um, and it does sort of what you expect. Uh, we get this drop off, but then there's this large constant uh, region um, um, across across that. And so if we take this and we subtract off the diffraction limited um, stuff from the full pupil and the, uh, add back in the diffraction limited stuff from the, from the blocked portion, uh, we get what's left over. So we get what this integral should look like. And it looks like function something like that. And they actually cut off at something like 1 plus epsilon, the, the scale of the annular pupil here. And so there's numbers here. So this integral can be done. Anybody knows the answer? Give me an email, please. <laughs> and uh, um, but uh, but so that's uh, that's somewhere we're 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 heading with this. Um, so just to wrap up here, uh, I managed to escape from the inferno, but I'm still in uh, in purgatory here. Um, my goal uh, from here on out is to generalize this to the off-axis uh, case. Uh, it's pretty much the same uh, procedure, the, uh, the projection onto the Zernike uh, polynomials, and then, um, and then using those expansion coefficients uh, through this exact same uh, technique here. Um, the annular pupils led to this nut new nasty um, integral uh, that still needs to, uh, uh, to be solved. 
And then the other thing is now that I have these analytic description of the individual terms of this series for uh, the optical transfer function, I want to orthogonalize those, and that will help to separate out uh, some of this cross or mixed talk uh, between uh, various components here. And the ultimate goal really is that uh, I have these set of, of B coefficients now that encapsulate all the appetization and all the wavefront error, and you can optimize those directly uh, as opposed to having to go through this iterative Fourier transform process, uh, and I think it will be much, much faster in order to just do that because they're just algebraic uh, sums that are, are relatively short and stuff like that. So, okay, thank you very much. Questions from the audience?